53 years. That's how long the Farm Monitor has provided news and information about agriculture, which is still Georgia's largest industry today. Sure, the program and the members of our Farm Monitor family have changed over the years, but our passion has been and always will be capturing the many stories of farmers and agriculture in Georgia and throughout the heartland of America. We're proud of that heritage, and as we ring in 2019, we are very excited to present to you a new era in Farm Monitor history. This is the Farm Monitor. For over 50 years, your source for agribusiness news and features from around the Southeast and across the country. Focusing on one of the nation's top industries, agriculture. The Farm Monitor is produced by one of the largest general farm organizations, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. So what do you think of the new digs? Pretty nifty, huh? Yes, after weeks of teasing you and giving you sneak peeks on social media, we can finally say yep. welcome to an all new Farm Monitor. And we would like to welcome our viewers seeing us for the very first time on our new partner, Georgia Public Broadcasting. If you're tuning in for the very first time, he's Ray D'Alessio and I'm Kenny Bergamy. Yes, a lot of new changes in store for you, but something we've always done here on the Monitor and will continue to do is the show lineup. So coming up, from start to finish, a behind the scenes look at the lengthy process that went into creating this new set and why the decision was made to rebrand the Farm Monitor. Also on the show, the 2018 Farm Bill and why the dairy industry says they're happy about it. And then later, GMOs, how much do you know about them and what's your source of information? Well, today on The Monitor, we hear from one farm family who tries to dispel all the myths and misconceptions about GMOs and why they say they're a must for agriculture to survive. These stories and so much more starting right now on The Farm Monitor. Between the low prices and ongoing labor shortages, it's been challenging times for the dairy industry. However, with a revamped dairy margin protection program and a new farm bill set to be implemented, will things turn around in 2019? Damon Jones has the story. No matter the season, no matter the weather, Georgia dairymen are hard at work year round to provide high quality milk for the consumers. However, over the past few years, they have run into some challenges that forced a number of smaller dairies out of business. Our dairy farmers have faced about five to six years of extremely low milk prices, which has really put pressure on our farmers, uh, especially our small dairy farms. Um, it's very expensive to feed cows and to control your input costs on the farm, so they've struggled. And we've seen a decrease about 40% of our dairy farms um, in Georgia over the last two years. We do expect to see prices maybe maintain or, or, or increase for about a dollar per hundred weight next year, which is really not going to be enough to cover our losses over the last four years. Um, so we, we do expect, unfortunately, some of our farmers to continue to sell out. That means changes will need to be made for the industry to start thriving again. And it's a couple of key issues leaders are focusing in on in 2019. We have to see some changes in labor. Um, labor is a top priority for us. Um, it affects all, not just our large dairy farmers, but our mid-sized and small dairymen. So we need to see some um, um, something passed to help our farmers with labor. We also need to see some changes in our promotion of dairy products, some innovation to see increase our consumption because people just aren't drinking milk like they have in the past. Because of that, dairymen nationwide saw prices drop nearly 40% over a four-year span. It's a hardship the government has taken notice of as they provided some safety nets for them in the new legislation. Well, we're pretty excited about the Farm Bill. Um, I think Congress has done a really good job of trying to work some of our programs out and make some um, improvements for our dairy farmers, especially our small dairymen. They revamped the uh, MPP program, the Margin Protection Program, and renamed it uh, the Dairy Mar Margin Coverage Program, and it will make it easier for our producers to buy coverage. The Margin Protection Program, which saw drastic changes last year, was a step in the right direction as it reduced premiums and increased coverage for smaller dairies. And it's just one of a few programs farmers can look into. We were pretty happy with the changes they made last year, just that they would be able to go back and buy some coverage to help fight those low milk prices. So we were pretty pleased with that over the last year. Um, and then to see them come back again and make some more improvements that 
We'll help some of our larger dairymen also that they can buy some coverage. It's cheaper now to buy some of that coverage. We also um, are very thankful for the American Farm Bureau for their work on developing the Dairy Revenue Program, which is another tool that they can use to buy coverage um, in addition to what is in the Farm Bill. So I feel like our industry worked together. Uh, Congress is working really hard to help us out. Reporting from Watkinsville, I'm Damon Jones for the Farm Monitor. Meantime, while 2018 was a difficult year for the agricultural economy, it was successful for ag policy. American Farm Bureau President Zippy Duvall says agriculture saw a number of victories, including extra help for struggling cotton and dairy producers, near total repeal of the estate tax, not to mention the 2018 Farm Bill. As far as 2019, President Duvall says trade will be a key area of focus. We're looking forward to continuing to work with the administration on the China issue. While the trade war is going on, we're encouraging them to move forward with that and try to help us there. But what we're really encouraged by is the letter that the president sent up to Congress of his intent to start discussions with Japan, EU, and the UK. And we think that there's great potentials in those three countries. When you picture a farmer, you tend to think of a person driving a tractor in a field and all is well. Well, sadly, that's not the case. In reality, the life of a farmer involves stress, doubt, and as some have already experienced, hopelessness. To address these issues, a rural stress summit was held recently in Atlanta. John Holcomb was there. Let's paint a picture. 40 plus hours a week, shrinking profit margins, crop devastating storms, and low commodity prices. All things that when combined could push someone to giving up, giving up on farming, or maybe even a step farther, giving up on life. Farming is one of the top vocations for suicide, which is why the University of Georgia's College of Ag and Environmental Sciences decided to take action. They've retracted it, but CDC had originally said farmers were the number one vocation for taking their lives. They've subsequently uh, reanalyzed the data, and now it's the third worst. Not a lot of comfort there. While at the conference, attendees get the chance to learn about what all stresses farmers out and why farmers are so susceptible to choosing suicide. One of the main reasons is due to the rural setting that they're in. In rural communities, people are, are obviously more isolated, and that means that the relationships that farmers do have, they lean on them and count on them more. So any disruption in a relationship, um, a breakup with a family member, somebody else passing in the family, is going to put them at greater risk. Not to mention all of the things that are out of a farmer's control. The weather, the tariffs, the general economy and prices and so that means that you're not no matter how hard you work you can't guarantee that you're going to have a positive outcome and that feeling of helplessness can really be associated with depression and with risk for suicide if someone is going through difficult times or maybe in a depressed state there are signs of stress or depression to be on the lookout for signs of stress i mean in general you're looking for changes in behavior people who stop eating who increase drinking, whose sleep get disrupted, who isolate, who don't want to go to church anymore, don't want to do the things that they used to do anymore. The really, really high-end warning signs, you might see things like people starting to show their loved ones where they keep all their important papers, wanting to give things away, wanting to make sure you know what's going on. If someone you know is showing these signs of stress, experts say that you should, in fact, do something about it that doing nothing is part of the problem. One of the most important things that, that we need to look at when it comes to how can we do something is, is focus on the issue at hand and say, okay, if they go to church and, and they haven't gone to church for three weeks in a row and they're churchgoers, talk to the minister and say, What's going on with, with Bob or Joan or whoever it is? They, they haven't been to church in three weeks. Experts say that talking about it with someone you know that is showing signs of stress is also a great thing to do. While it's really hard to talk about, I think talking about it is important and really asking somebody that you love. I love you. I care about you. I'm seeing these differences. I'd like to take you to talk to and then somebody that that person trusts. Maybe it's a clergyman that the person feels good about and that you know understands these issues. Maybe it's a primary care provider. Reporting in Atlanta for the Farm Monitor, I'm John Holcomb. John, thank you so much. Now when we come back, from start to finish, we take you behind the scenes and show you the complete revamp 
of the Farm Monitor and the teamwork that went into everything you see now. I think Extension doesn't, when we think about 4-H, we think about youth development and obviously that's the purpose of why we're there. We're to, to give young people opportunities to develop themselves in all kind of different facets that's going to help them and benefit them in their future. But then I think sometimes the thing that's not seen is the development of the agent and the people that are working with those young people. Uh, Extension gives you opportunities to uh, put yourself in situations that get you out your comfort zone, that may stretch you a little bit and at the time it may seem difficult but then a few weeks or a few months later you look back and say, boy, that really prepared me for this, this obstacle or this opportunity. Uh, the Extension family is, is uh, something that's really special. Uh, not only, you know, we're broken down into several districts, four districts across the state, but uh, when it comes to our family, it's all across the state. And then as we get to really know folks from those district lines uh, and get really involved in Extension, you get to meet people from all over the country. And so your, your family is not only right there in your county, uh, with those people you see every day, but those, those folks in the district, in the state, and really across the country. Uh, Extension is someone that cares about folks, not only about their clients, but also about their employees uh, and their coworkers. And we welcome you back to an all new, and hopefully you'll agree, improved farm monitor. Now, as radical as the changes may seem, the set upgrade, the new music, graphics, etc., they were long overdue. And truth be told, this is something that was years in the making. And for many of us, at least for me anyway, as Kenny will attest, as the process progressed, it became a labor of love and somewhat of an obsession. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next week right here on the Farm Monitor. Have a great week. On November 27th of 2018, we officially taped our last show on the old set. Moments later, Kenny and I gave it the proper send-off. Through the magic of time-lapse photography, we're able to show you hours and weeks of hard work and labor in just a short amount of time. But in order to give you the full appreciation of the process, let's jump back in time to the fall of 2016, when the idea of a whole new reboot was born. It began with several trips to Ridgeland, Mississippi, home of Mad Genius Advertising Agency. In those meetings, many ideas were thrown around, including renaming the program. But in the end, it was decided that the Farm Monitor brand is a name people have come to know and trust. It was also in those meetings when talk of a new set became a visual reality. This was a long, skillful uh, process that we went through selecting each part of the brand. You know, when we started in 66 and through the 70s and the 80s and even to 2000, we really hadn't did a really brand makeover for the Farm Monitor. And so for us, the Farm Monitor, there were lots of discussions on maybe dropping you know, certain names, you know, creating something totally different. But you know, for our organization and for the members that we serve and our audience, we felt it was important to maintain the Farm Monitor. And I think the fresh look that you see with the graphics package, uh, the logo that you see, I think it's just, uh, just a modification, just a slight modification from where we've been. But the thing is, is we're going to continue to tell those stories that we tell each and every week to our viewers. Ray does a wonderful job putting the show together. I can't say enough about what Ray does for the show. It's his heart and passion, and, and I just look forward to the next 10, 15 years of what broadcast television will do for the Farm Monitor. So once the pieces were in place and the foundation set, it was time to find someone who could take all those pieces and make them come to life. That's where Spiller's design and construction came into play. Owner Justin Spiller's telling me the fact that his company was chosen for such a special project was, well, a match that was meant to be. We've been a part of Georgia Farm Bureau for many years, been part family, been through 4-H with them. They've always been big sponsors of it. Family members always have done big poultry farms, been into cows, so I've always been known of Georgia uh, Farm Bureau. So it's been a big honor to have something like this be shown um, that they can be a part of and put our stamp on it as well. For me, the goal was to bring it to a more modern, contemporary, warm feel for our viewerships. You know, we've been on air since 1966, and so styles and, and, and different looks have changed, and so we really wanted to look on the show to kind of maybe be able to something that would get us over, say, five, six years. 
And so we're real excited about what we've got down there. Uh, I think it turned out extremely well. Looking forward to the next 52 years of whatever television brings for us. Yeah, amazing job by everybody involved. We cannot forget about Delane, who actually crafted the tabletop, and also the man who lit the set for us, Jim Stiganoffi. Great job, Jim, and great working with you. Also, special thanks to the incredible maintenance engineers here at Farm Bureau, Kerry, Don, Joe, and Sean. You guys are the best, and we couldn't have done it without your help either. Now, time for the final break. Up next, GMOs. One farm family speaks out against the many misconceptions about them and why they say GMOs are essential for sustainability. Three generations stand right here. Technically, I'm the Steve's the sixth, and I'm the seventh generation that's farmed the family land here. So that's something to, you know, we take pride in what we do. So of course we're not going to grow something that's going to be harmful because we're going to, like he said, we're going to eat it too. So that's something that I think that in itself will, you know, should answer a lot of questions. Wheat corn, soybeans, and I'm uh, starting to grow malting barley. And um, they're the only two that are um, GMOs will be corn and soybeans. Wheat's not a GMO. Genetically modified is basically they're taking uh, genetics out of different seeds and um, crossbreeding them so they can um, produce the I mean, so we can grow the maximum yield. So without that, they're basically able to take one that's better in uh, drought tolerance and stuff like that, and they can breed that into um, a hybrid or a seed that's going to do better here, where we're going to grow better crops. And most GMO crops are not fed straight to the consumer. So you're never eating a, a GMO. You're not going to go out to a cornfield and pick a ear of corn and. and uh, the only corn that you're going to eat out of the field is not, is most of it's non-GMO. So, so your flour, your bread, is your, flour, not, your biscuits, your everything is not, not been GMO. genetically modified whatsoever. So, I, so when you see the next loaf of bread that says non-GMO, <laughs> that's a pretty good sales pitch. <laughs> so we made our battle against her, uh, weeds and insects a whole lot easier. I mean, it was a wow factor. Um, uh, it cost. The technology costs a good bit, but in the long run, it's worth it uh, for the yield to return. And uh, it, it would almost—it's impossible—it'd be impossible by the farm now without it. Conventional type farming, you can't really—you can't survive these days, especially with commodity prices. Commodity prices at, at the, where they're at at this point, you cannot grow the yields that that's going to give you. You can't grow it and, and survive, and especially with our equipment costs land, leasing land, everything else, all your expenses coming in, you can't afford to sustain your farm if you don't, if you don't grow these type of crops. Just because we're not, you couldn't produce the yield to, to get the dollar that you need to, to survive. So, That's one of the biggest misconceptions right now is GMO. It would be impossible to feed this country if you farm it. If you did not. With no genetical modification. I just got back from a meeting in uh, Dow Chemical and one of the scientists there where uh, his, um, one way he said he answered questions was, all right, when you eat um, beef, you you actually grow horns. So, and I, I thought that was about the smartest way and the best way ever put is, you have your certain amount of genes in your body, you're not gonna, your genes are not gonna genetically modify, <laughs> they're gonna be the same, so. Even though we're using them, in my opinion, it makes us better farmers because we're using less chemicals, less fertilizer, and growing higher yields, which the population's growing, farmers and lands Decreasing. getting smaller, so it's going to take higher yields to continue to, to meet the, you know, the population, um, the population, and to feed them. So, farming is just a, you know, many people say it's a way of life. It's something you got to love. It's just, you didn't love it, you couldn't do it. No, we don't get up in the morning <laughs> counting the dollar. We get up in the morning to do what we love to do. Uh, 
And long as at the end of the day we feed our families, we're good. Well, finally this week in the dead of winter, 4-H agents are looking to the future. Yeah, they're pitching the idea of summer camp to kids, getting them excited and parents prepared for a great experience. Charles Denny has more on the selling points of clover camping. Oh, sure, it's bleak outside now. But if you're a kid with a little imagination, it's easy to flash forward to the summer of 2019 and maybe some of this. <laughs> 4-H camp is just a few months away, and statewide agents are busy making their pitch. Zip lining. Zip lining is great. I am certified to send people down the zip line. So. Wilson County UT Extension agent Morgan Beatty, a veteran camper and camp employee herself, says 4-H summer fun is actually a pretty easy sell. Honestly, a couple of the big selling points right now are the zip line, the water slide. Those are big things that mm -hmm. cross and that usually get some very excited. Also, as crazy as it sounds, one of the biggest selling points is uh, no parents for a week. <laughs> <laughs> but there will be plenty of adult supervision, as well as teen leaders like Tabitha Jenkins and Brandon Shrum, who lead groups of kids in a number of activities. I'm kind of like their mom for the week. They're my kids. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I kind of like help them. Uh, the ones that get homesick, I help mentor them. It's been awesome overall. You get, you get to be like one of their dads mm -hmm. and just lead them through the whole week. Last year, more than 5,000 young people attended summer camp at the 348 centers in Greenville, Crossville, and Columbia, as well as STEM programs at Lone Oaks Farm in West Tennessee. That was a record number of kids, and the goal is to top it in 2019. 4-H leaders want parents to know the camps are safe, many with updated facilities, and accredited by the strict guidelines of the American Camp Association and University of Tennessee. We, we train extension agents to um, start promoting camp early um, so that parents can plan. The, the basic premise uh, for 4-H camping, uh, especially during the summer, is building life skills. The first camps will be open the week after Memorial Day and run through the end of July. So if you're a kid or interested parent, endure a winter for now, but know that summer adventure could be in your future. This is Charles Denny reporting. Charles, thank you very much, and thank you for watching the all-new Farm Monitor. Yeah, here's a reminder for all the latest ag info regarding food, great recipes, and what's happening down on the farm. Be sure you check out our Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest pages. You'll stay informed and see what's up in the world of farming, plus with us here on the show. We leave you today with another look at how all this came about a few months condensed down to just about a minute. Have a great week, everybody.